Good. <clears throat> Good morning. Today is Friday. It's Friday. It finally came. Today is Friday the 12th, and we're going to start with a daily reflection on the New Testament. My hair's all over it. All right. Nope, not Friday the 12th. Revelation chapter 12. Friday the 15th. It needs to be Saturday. Okay. Friday the 15th. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert it, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. James chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. King Benjamin spoke of obtaining a remission of sins through putting off the natural man and putting on Christ. He also explained how we may keep a remission of sins. For the sake of retaining a remission of your sins from day to day, that ye may walk guiltless before God, I would that ye should impart of your substance to the poor. Ooh, excuse me both spiritually and temporally, according to their wants. We enjoy the blessings of the Master in our personal lives to the extent that we are engaged in the work of the Master in blessing others. The, el the early elders of this dispensation were thus instructed to thrust in your sickle with all your soul, and your sins are forgiven you. In short, we save more than one person, when we lead another soul to salvation. <sighs> All right. So Revelation chapter 12 is today. Um, in this, it sounds like the war in heaven. Um, John sees the eminent apostasy of the church. He also sees the war in heaven in the beginning when Satan was cast down. He sees the continuation of the war of that war on earth. Yeah, that's what I got from it. Um, so there, there wasn't much. Again, I think we're gonna have some issues here with this, uh, with this uh, book of Revelation in finding what we can apply to our lives. What I took from this um, chapter was verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. For me, the, the part that I focused on was that the devil has great wrath because he knows he has a short time. He knows that the end is near. He knows that he only has this much time to collect as many souls as he possibly can, to make as many people as miserable as him, to, what would you say, um, begrudge Heavenly Father of his children. Um, so, for my personal statement, I wrote, the devil knows he has but a short time to, to collect souls, Will I give him mine? So that's my personal statement for today. Um, <clears throat> I kind of like that we have to dig a little deeper and we have to get a little bit more context for finding a personal statement in these chapters. All right. We have Jeffrey for today. <clears throat> Or Revelation chapter 12. Oh goodness, it's a long one. Okay. An idea I have spent a lot of time thinking about is introduced in the book of Revelation with these very familiar lines. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. 
He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. One does not have to be trained a trained theologian to understand where that battle took place, the confrontation in which the righteous fought against that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, is rightfully referred to as the war in heaven. However, I confess that I am a little uncomfortable with that phrase. As if because it started in heaven, it also ended there. This war has not concluded. Though I do not wish to introduce any new doctrine or be iconoclastic regarding biblical imagery, it would seem that, theologically speaking, it may be more appropriate to call this the battle because the war is still very much on. At the end of that battle, and I chose to call it that, there was a great momentary triumph, exulting cry by the victors, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. For they have overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their own lives, but kept the testimony even unto death. That is a statement about Christ before he ever came to earth, a statement about his blood before he ever had any, a statement about our testimony in him before we ever knew fully what that would mean. It meant something there, but it would come to mean more here. His mission, our belief, and faith in him, his success and salvation and atonement in this life would obviously take on much more with, a, with the passage of time. There was a resplendent and resounding cry through the heavens, at least for a time that Christ and we had won. Success in this conflict came through the strength and power of Christ and our loyalty to him. In his gospel, we found something to love more than anything else, something we were filling, something we were willing to fight for, even as it were to the death. Above all else, we wanted to preserve, retain, and protect the things that we had been taught and the plan that had been presented by a loving father, championed by a loving son, opposed by a rebellious one. The meaning of this chapter is made more clear by the verses that follow. For when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which, fought, which brought forth the man-child. Therefore the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God, and have a testimony of Jesus Christ. Who is that? Who is it that the dragon wishes to fight in this world? Whom would he win? Whom would he destroy? What battle would he hope to be victorious in? He fights against those who keep the commandments of God and have a testimony of Jesus. Who was it that he fought before? Those who kept the commandments of God and have a testimony of Jesus Christ. Who is it that he fights now? Those who keep the commandments of God and have a testimony of Jesus Christ. The war is not ceased. The terrain and a few of the tactics have changed, but the war that started a long time ago is still on. In it, you and I are marked men and women. I say that with the understanding that all of us who were entitled to come here and keep our second estate rejoiced in the knowledge that we were those who loved our not our lives unto death, but overcame there the accuser of our brethren, day and night, and we overcame him through the Lamb, just as we were objects of his opposition and persecution and betrayal then, so we are objects of his persecution and terror and betrayal here. This chapter in Revelation has become increasingly important to me as I ponder the nature of our work, what it is we are supposed to be doing, what I believe we face, and how serious and dangerous it can be. If we understood what we may have understood once before, we would be far more fearful, far more faithful, and surely far more fit for the battle that some of us are some of us now are
if it is true that Satan wanted to destroy us once before and that he still wants to do so now, what does that tell us about him? It says something about his tenacity. It says something about his convictions. It says something about his unwillingness to yield or submit or give up until the very last triumph, triumphant moment when Christ comes and the devil is cast into our cast into outer darkness forever. But until that moment, he believes he is in this war, believes that he still has not only a fighting chance, but an almost overwhelming opportunity for victory. He understands that he has lost the savior of this world and a number of righteous men and women from Adam and Eve down to the present, but he believes he has not lost you and me. He thinks that our own sons and daughters are perfectly fair game, and if there are those among us who keep the commandments of God and have a testimony of Jesus, he will simply roll out heavier, heavier artillery and go after them as well. Satan is proud and relentless. He believes he will yet win the major portion of the children of God. He took a third of them once before, and he thinks he can take a good goodly number the second time around. We understand that part of the nature of the battle in the pre-mortal existence was the controversy over agency. We sometimes speak of agency as if it were an end in itself, but agency is not an end, but a very significant and important and fundamental means to an end. The issue at that time had to do with choices, including the ability to carry out those choices. But behind that issue was the simple proposition that by choosing correctly and living with those choices faithfully, you and I can become like God. Outside of this, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that idea would be branded as heretical. It was, in fact, part of of that for which Christ was put to death. The suggestion that we can acquire divine attributes, that we can grow and develop and progress, that we can move through whatever stages of existence there are until we become like God, is what the pre-mortal conference, confusion, and ultimate battle were about. It is still what the battle is about here. Lucifer does not want you or me to become like God. He doesn't want anyone to be like God. He doesn't even want God to be like God. He wants, he wants to be God. He has the audacity to say, in effect, I will do it. Send me, but I want the honor and the glory and the kingdom and the crown. In the meantime, you, Father, can step down. We believe that with effort and grace, with knowledge and ordinances and obedience to the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we can become like our Father in heaven. But we do not want to take his place. We do not want to claim his honor or his glory, nor will we ever set Jesus aside or Michael or Enoch or Adam or Abraham or Moses. No, we believe that all, each in his or her own place, can have the great promise of being a god or a goddess, a king or a queen, a priest or a priestess. And that is what Satan is opposing. He cannot live with the idea that anyone would have power or kingdoms or principalities but him. If he cannot have it all, he is determined not to give any inheritance to someone else. I'm just going to take a minute there with that one. You almost don't want to say anything after Jeffrey speaks because there's no point in it. My goodness, he's wonderful. Okay, there's a little bit more. That was the end of one part where he talked about th there's another one. May I encourage all of you to bear witness of the Savior of the world. There is a powerful spirit that comes in the very name of Jesus Christ. The spirit that attends that name will help you speak and will convey its own power whenever you bear your testimony of the Son of God, His mission, and His church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Even though the veil of forgetfulness is drawn over our minds and we do not remember our pre-mortal existence, 
Nevertheless, every single human being on this planet sat with us in those pre-mortal councils and heard the Father and the Son teach the plan of salvation. As we know from the book of Revelation, two-thirds of that spiritual family remained faithful and earned the right to come to the earth. Every mortal on this earth earned his or her right to be here because of their testimony of Jesus in that pre-mortal world. So everyone you see on the streets and in shops coming and going in all directions once knew the same of Jesus Christ and bore testimony of his divinity. Therefore, if we can bear our testimony effectively and spiritually, many of them will recall those feelings. Some may even hear an echo of their own pre-mortal existence when you bear witness of Christ's name. All right, Jeffrey. He's chastised me. There was a customer. Yesterday and the day before. Absolutely awful. Absolutely awful. I wasn't the kindest. And when she left, I definitely talked about her. And I definitely talked about her to a lot of people. And I should have been kinder. I could have handled the situation better. She came in heated. Okay, she came in heated, and right off the bat, I was on my guard, and uh, she had said something like, I've never had to do this before, and I just went, like, what do you want me to do about it kind of thing, instead of, like, explaining things to her better. I did in the end, but that was, that was the tipping point. She started yelling at me after I shrugged my shoulders, and I shouldn't have done that. Okay. A little bit more. I know this video is running long, but I did some stuff yesterday for my three-month preparation for general conference. I've got, I couldn't find exactly like something that was like the meat, you know what I'm saying, of what I want to do for the challenge because it's a month of prayer, it's a month of service, and it's a month of sacrifice. So for service, I've got a service calendar here that I found on Pinterest, but some of them are like donate clothes, which I can totally do, but, or like read to a child, do that all the time. So anyways, that was one of them. But then I found this one, which is a hundred acts of kindness, random acts of kindness. And like, it's like, uh, offer someone your pen. I do that constantly. Uh, but here's one. Take a day not to complain. Uh, let's see. Uh, thank a teacher with a gift. Buy ice cream for a child. I don't know. Some of these, they're not all winners. Okay. But we're going to put these up on the board and we're going to see what we can do. And then I found a 30 day prayer challenge or like a January prayer challenge. Uh, which I printed out, and I'm going to see how that goes. Like, um, day one is pray for spiritual growth and revival in your life and in the life of your family and friends. May God shape you all and mold you in his image this year. I kind of read through a few of these, and I kind of liked some of them. It's, it's more than just the regular pray for your husband, pray for the government, pray for your finances, I don't, I'm not really into that sort of thing. Um, no, that's something else. That's, that's my hotel in Virginia. Um, but I want to make not a prayer Bible, but a prayer book of Mormon. So what I would like is if you guys could send me your favorite book of Mormon verses that almost seem like prayer to you or that you could use in your prayer or that you have used in your prayer. I want to make a prayer book of Mormon. I thought about this because they have the prayer Bibles and they have like the Psalms and then you're just supposed to like paraphrase the verses and make your own prayer out of them. And I was like, that doesn't seem, I don't know. It didn't seem fitting. So when was it? It was last year. I had done a study of the book of Mormon and I went through, I didn't, okay. I read the whole, 
I read half of the Book of Mormon and then I listened to the other half of it because it was before bed and I was saying, anyways, you don't care. And I highlighted verses about prayer, but I didn't get all the way through. So I was like, okay, which verses do I like out of the Book of Mormon? I've got them, a notebook somewhere. I got to find it. But if you guys could send me your favorite Book of Mormon verses that feel like prayer to you or like you hold dear, like feel like a prayer when you read it, you feel connected to Heavenly Father. If you could send me those, that would be great. I want to start compiling. I'm excited about this. I want to go buy a brand new Book of Mormon. I want to get new highlighters, new pens, new tabs. All right, I will stop talking now. Today is the 15th. And this is a baptism prayer from the Book of Common Prayer, 1928. Almighty and everlasting God, who by the baptism of thy well-beloved Son, Jesus Christ, in the River Jordan, did sanctify water to the mythical washing away of sin, mercifully look upon this child, wash him, and sanctify him with the Holy Spirit, that he may be received into the ark of Christ's church, and being steadfast in faith, joyful through hope, and rooted in charity, may so pass the waves of this troublesome world that finally he may come to the land of everlasting life there to reign with the world without end through jesus christ our lord all right that was revelation chapter 12 and we do chapter 13 tomorrow today's friday let's get it done love you all bye